my name is Justine Lin, Resource Center Assistant here with Heritage Mississauga. And welcome back for another Saturday matinee. Um, I would encourage everyone before I start to like, follow, and subscribe to stay up to date on all the heritage happenings here with Heritage Mississauga. Now, without further ado, let's just get right into it. Um, so today I wanted to talk a bit about um, Angelo Blues. He was a Mississauga-based artist, and if you don't know any of his works, he is known um, for these really unique uh, brick relief sculptures, um, and you can find them around the city, in parks, um, businesses, schools, that kind of stuff. Um, he was quite prolific. Um, so in 1999, we did an oral history with Angelo, and he was able to tell us about his life, um, immigrating to Canada, and, um, uh, and, you know, his art and what inspired him, things like that. So um, I thought that we could talk a bit about that today and hear actually from his, in his own words, about his experiences. So let's just get right into it. Um, so Angelo Belluz was born in Anzano di Cimo, Perdono, Italy in 1924, and he was born to a farming family. Um, and obviously growing up in that uh, type of community, you know, you're surrounded by great art, great architecture from some of the greats um, in, the, in the history of art, right? So. Um, that very much inspired him as a young person. He wrote, as a child and young man growing up in Anzano, Italy, I was constantly surrounded by the art of my forefathers. So that would very much come into play in his later life. Um, so in 1949, he immigrated to Canada and settled in Port Credit. And uh, Blues came first, and then he was later joined by his wife. And in the beginning, it was hard to adjust to Canadian life. You know, there's a new culture, a new language, new people. So that was very tricky. And he didn't necessarily know, um, you know, what to do and how to navigate in that kind of world. So he talked a little bit about that here. At the same time, we went to school at the drawing by grocery at the store. We were presented to the uh, to the to the storekeeper at five dollars because I was expected the money back from years ago. I don't know where I was money was. So very first day. So I, I said to myself that uh, to the school from the beginning of the ABC arranging uh, uh, again that because that was the school because that's from the house. Yeah. Yeah, so um, so simple things that, you know, us Canadians take for granted, like um, going to the grocery store and knowing how much the currency is worth, um, you know, and, and how much things are in the store, um, to just being able to read and write in English and knowing the ABCs. Um, so, you know, everything was different for him and he really had to learn quickly. Um, and in those early days, um, there was a very, very small Italian community in historic Mississauga. It was not like uh, the Little Italy in Toronto. It was a tiny, tiny community. Everyone more or less knew each other. Um, and he talks about this one encounter where um, he was at a festival or some kind of community event in uh, in I believe it was Port Credit um around uh, 1950 and um a man came up to him and was asking him if he was Italian and so he said yes I'm Italian they started speaking Italian and he realized oh he's speaking around about the same dialect that I am and that made him really excited right um that there was another Italian guy from around the same region as he was um, and those little things, those little interactions really stuck with him. Um, and, you know, he meets one person, he meets another person, someone knows someone else. And all of a sudden, you have this very small Italian community. Um, 
And those people that he made friends with, they were able to um, help him navigate his new life. So he talked about that a little bit here. Uh, well, actually, uh, you know, as, as, a, as an immigrant, sometimes you, you got to step together because mm -hmm. you don't have another place to go. You, you, you can't speak the language. I don't, I don't know, the Canadian here, they, 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 they won't understand that. Mm -hmm. They don't understand it. So they kind of look sideways to us because, uh, but they had hope to stay. They were here before us, and uh, you know. Uh, but the next year, uh, year went by, and uh, everybody did work very hard. Yeah. So um, you know, they he recalls this feeling of isolation and feeling like the Canadians were kind of looking at them sideways, um, you know, and uh, so it's hard to feel like you're at home and you belong when everything and everyone is telling you that you don't belong here. Um, and I'm sure that that's a feeling that a lot of people have had um, if you immigrate here. Um, and, you know, I mean, it does pass, but um, it was very hard and so that's why uh his friends that he met fellow italians they had to really stick together um and as i said you know it did pass he um by the end of his life ha was canadian right um five years after um uh he arrived here he began the process of becoming a canadian citizen um, that's not to say that he, you know, renounced his Italian culture or anything like that. He was very, very proud to be Italian. Um, but, you know, home is really where the family is, right? And so his children were born here, his grandchildren were born here. And so ultimately your home is Canada um, at the end of the day. And so that's kind of how he felt, that he was Italian-Canadian. Um, and he talks a bit about... Um, when he got his citizenship and how that felt to him. Then, uh, oh, after five years being here, paper, we had to go to Boston sometimes. Uh, people asking questions that people not to me. And uh, so, uh, we got to see the same paper. We, we thought we had like a million dollars. Okay, no, they could go to the state uh, to do that friend for her, I mean, a friend for her. Yeah, so, I mean, there's so many liberties that you get when you're a Canadian citizen. And um, so it was really important and special for him to get that um, that piece of paper um, that said that he was a citizen. Um, as he kind of mentioned, you know, you're able to much more easily go to the United States because he had a lot of friends um, there. And so, you know, it was really nice to be able to to do those things. Um, and, you know, and he felt like at the time, like he had a million dollars in his pocket. So um, that was really special for him. Now, when he first came, he had to find work very quickly, obviously to support himself and his wife. Um, and, um, so he began, um, to look for work and he looked, in, um, at different places. He, um, was thinking maybe he would be a construction worker at first. Um, but because obviously in winter, it's very hard to do construction. Uh, the construction workers typically got, uh, winters off. Um, and so he thought that it was actually better to work the full year because even though construction workers got paid a little bit more, um, you know, he was willing to take a pay cut to be able to work the whole year because overall you would get more money, if that makes sense. Um, and also, too, is that he uh, didn't have a car and with construction, you would have to commute all these different places. And so he was just not able to do that. So he needed somewhere that was close by, um, was decent money, um, and was able to, uh, he was able to work all year round. So that's when he stumbled upon, upon the Cooksville Brickyard in 1950. He began working there. At the time, it was called La Prairie Brick. It later was Domtar, and then finally uh, Canada Brick. 
And his first job was hauling and loading bricks. And they would um, put straw between the bricks so that they wouldn't kind of uh, crash together and stuff. And then he would load it onto a truck. So he talked a little bit about that here. They uh, would bring out a with a couple of feet of long on top of uh, bricks. Uh, with a big long uh, glove from the earth on the, on the truck. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to put straw in between because uh, they, they, you know, they bang each other, they get cheaper, you know, it's basic, so they don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was my job, a lot of bricks all the along. Imagine that. And the weather was just terrible, they came. Uh, so I didn't know, I didn't have enough clothes at the time, but a friend of mine, uh, I don't know the man, he was here before me, he had a lot of clothes and uh, a pair of high boots, and uh, so I know I, I got by on that. And, uh, oh man, it was cold. Uh, yeah, so um, he was not used to the Canadian winters, um, and so who was there to help him but his friends uh, once again? So they came through for him and uh, and gave him an old coat and a pair of boots, um, but you can imagine how hard that would be, you know, you just landed and, uh, and you're working in the winter, you've never experienced Canadian winters for when you're working there. Um, I mean, it must have just been um, very challenging, you know. Um, so I wanted to talk a bit about um, the Cooksville Brickyard for a second. Um, and I don't know if people know this, but there's um, actually an abundance of red clay in the soil uh, in Cooksville. And so the Ontario National Brick uh, Company they decided they were going to buy uh, the site in 1912 on the corner of Dundas and Mavis Road. Um, and, uh, you know, they wanted to, I guess, um, take advantage of those natural resources. And so um, it existed under many different companies over the years. There was the Cooksville Shale Brick Company, the Cooksville Brick and Tile Company, the Cooksville Company Limited, on the Ontario National Brickworks, Cooksville La Prairie Brick Company, which was when um, Angelo started. Uh, that's what it was called, and then later Dom Tar, and then finally Canada Brick, as I've mentioned before. Um, and yeah, and Canada Brick is very famous. You guys might know it. it at one point, was the largest uh, brick brick maker in Canada. Um, so that's pretty impressive. Um, now the Coastal Brickyard uh, ceased operation in the nineteen nineties. And the site was later developed for residential and commercial purposes. So, yeah, if you've ever, if you know Dundas and Mavis, this no longer exists there. But at the time, it did, and it was quite profitable, and that's where Angelo worked. Um, now, a secondary kind of job that he would do on the side was um, the uh, brickyard would give him, obviously, an hour lunch. But that time was way too valuable to spend just eating lunch. So he decided that he was going to work as a barber and he could cut uh, four heads in an hour each for 40 cents. Uh, so at the time that was pretty good money for a gig on the side. And to be honest, he needed the money, any money that he could get, he needed because, you know, he had um, a growing family to support. Right. So he talked a little bit about that here. Uh, as a doctor, uh, after you, I the So, uh, the only people like I was, they are the only people they come over to me and, uh, and the barber and the area is completely full of So did you stop? So I, I did. Uh, I did not stop. I just slowed down a little bit because mm -hmm. I didn't want to stop. That was, that was my trade to see uh, and this square hat to uh, make me stop. Uh, yeah, so I just find this hilarious, this story, because 
the barber in the area got so mad at him for cutting in on his business that, you know, he ordered him to stop at Angelo. Uh, you know, of course he didn't stop. He was saying, you know, oh, this is my trade. Like, why are you going to ask me to stop? So, um, uh, so, you know, he maybe slowed down a bit, but he didn't stop. Um, and yeah, and because that was his trade. Um, now, his passion was always art. I think he was just a creative person. So, you know, things like cutting hair. I mean, that's also very creative, right? Um, painting, sculpting. These were all things that he just did. Um, and I should say that when he got to the brickyard, you know, there's clay everywhere. And when he got the clay in his hand, hands, it was almost like an instinct. Like he just had to create and had to sculpt with it. And so he very quickly began sculpting. Um, and I don't know if he necessarily thought that he would um, was going to have a future in sculpting at the brickyard. I don't know if he knew how his career would necessarily progress, but I think he knew that he wanted to do more than just loading and hauling bricks all day. Um, he was a very talented and impressive person, and so he wanted to develop a trade um, while he was in Canada. So he talked a little bit about that here. Um, so we had a change here yeah, actually, uh, because I worked in the big air, uh, the money was not too bad, but it was, you know, to learn there actually. And then, so I began to, uh, to, uh, Paint of uh, myself, no drawing, something like that with uh, my you know, family actually, my brother. Uh, and then by working there, the uh, I became very successful. I had to look at this clay in my hand, and then I began to uh, make the uh, telephones and jewelry boxes out of a shiny clay and stuff like that. And uh, I found it very, very interesting. Yeah, so he just started making these small things, like he was saying, the flower pots and jewelry boxes. And it just, it started out small, but I think he really had an interest in it um, and really enjoyed it. And so, you know, he did actually invest in his own artistic abilities. You know, he took night classes and uh, learned various different art forms, including pottery, painting, making stained glass windows. I believe he was also uh, making signs at one point. So, you know, he was doing a lot of different things creatively. Um, and I mean, I have to applaud him for, um, you know, investing in his own future and his own talent and seeing that, you know, he he enjoyed it and that he did have some talent there um, that could be drawn out. Um, so he began, so he continued, I should say, to make these um, small sculptures and then, you know, it got bigger and bigger and his first kind of um, bass relief sculpture is what they call it. Um, and this type of sculpture was what he would become known for and famous for uh, in the area locally. Um, so the first one he ever made was of a crane, which is very Angelo. Angelo loved birds um, and, you know, much, much of his work was of birds. Um, and I kind of find it interesting that it was of a crane because, um, you know, he was in Port Credit. So I wonder if that had anything to do with it at all. Um, now, this is kind of interesting, though, because... You know, if I were to be going and, uh, you know, and making art on my spare time while, while I was at work, I don't know, maybe my boss might say, oh, well, maybe you're not supposed to do that. Like, do your job, right? But, I mean, kudos on his boss because he saw Angelo's talent and was very impressed um, and realized that, you know, this could really be a good thing for the company. And so he set... Angelo up in a studio of his own and encouraged him to continue and make more. So he talked a little bit about that pivotal moment here. Now, I start to make a sculpture of my own. 
Yeah, so um, I just find, find it so interesting, um, you know, the, is I, and I, it's interesting because Angelo, you know, once again, he didn't necessarily know that his talent would lead him down this road in the brickyard. But, you know, when his boss offered him, hey, do you want to continue? He kind of took that leap, leap of faith and was like, yeah, of course, why not, right? Um, and so he started to do bigger things, um, different, uh, many different designs. Um, and his boss decided to invite the architects up, right, who were um, at the time, uh, you know, Mississauga, as we know it, was really shaping up. It was um, uh, being built, right? This is when when a lot of the uh, uh, the buildings, the suburbs, the developments, this is when this is all happening. And so um, the architects are, you know, working very closely with the Cooksville Brickyard. And so they saw all this and they decided, oh, well, like we would also want these, this artwork to adorn our parks, our schools, our businesses that we're building. Um, so, you know, and as Angela says, there was no end to that. So the process in which he would do this was, as I was saying, the architect would provide the idea typically. Um, they might give a sketch or just talk about it and Angelo would sketch it himself um, and he would enlarge the sketch so he could kind of work off of it. And he uh, would get the clay soft enough to mold and then he would stick the clay onto a plywood backing that was like two foot by two foot. And then he would sculpt the subject roughly with a hammer. And then he would um, get the small details with um, a, a smaller tool, basically. And then he would use the powdered uh, color pigments, which you can mix with water and it creates many, many different colors. Um, and then he would paint the subject. Remember that he had taken a painting in night school. So, um, you know, all of that training is coming into play as well. Um, and then he fires the relief at 2000 degrees in a kiln. Once that is done, the color stays. Um, it is permanent. And then it can be assembled on location brick by brick by Angelo himself. Um, and so that, so that was typically the process in which he did it. Um, now I want to look at some of his most memorable pieces because um, there are many. The first and, and arguably uh, the most famous, at least in Mississauga, is his Streetsville uh, Founders Bread and Honey Festival sculpture at Streetsville Memorial Park. Um, so I don't know if anyone knows the, um, kind of story or inspiration behind this, uh, particular sculpture, um, but I'm going to play you a little clip of him talking about kind of the conception of this piece. Uh, 
you know, the politician there and Nando Ivanica were cousins. He was when the same way I do to like to react with more of my ideas. So, he came back to me, he said, What's the problem? It's kind of a little bit of a problem, you know. Uh, so, uh, he said that. He said that they would like to have a, as a, as a, going back to you, as, as a family to immigrate to Canada from Europe somewhere. Yes, yeah, so um, this was really the brainchild of then Councillor Nando Anika, Angela Belouz, as well as, of course, the Streetsville Brand Honey um, Festival um, organization. Um, so you know, Anika, he wanted it to be about basically a family immigrating here from Europe, uh, somewhere in Europe, um, and just like Angela, right, a family, um, and then the, one of the, uh, women from the Streetsville, uh, Bread and Honey Festival, she had a photograph, actually, of, like, a, a family and they're dressed in kind of 1800s clothing you know there's a child uh the parents a baby that kind of thing and that was actually the exact picture that um that this sculpture is based off of um so you can actually see this it's at the Streetsville memorial park so you can go and you can see that um, another very, very famous one is the Brickyard Eagle sculpture at Cooksville's Brickyard Park, um, which, and I love this one because I think it's really fitting to uh, kind of um, commemorate the Brickyard because one, it's, it's Angelo, and two, it is so Angelo because, like I said, it's a bird. He loved birds. And I can see why. I mean, they're very fun. You know, you have all the feathers. There's many different colors to it. So I can see why he liked this, right? Um, so anywho, uh, so yeah, so you can see that as well at the Cooksville's Brickyard Park. Um, yeah, and the thing is, when you start walking around the city and noticing these things, you know, there's really no end to it. And um, uh and you're just going to keep noticing it. So, you know, could be a, like a fun little scavenger hunt, right? Um, another fun one was of a space shuttle and the moon, and it's um, very celestial. And uh, he's actually pictured here with astronaut Roberta Bondar, who some of you may know. Um, another uh, kind of series, I should say, of ones that he did is um, of indigenous uh, figures. So this one is of a man and a woman in profile. Um, and it was presented to then Mayor Hazel McCallion on behalf of Canada Brick. And it was featured in her home for many, many years. And recently it was featured at um, ha the Hazel 100 Years of Memory exhibit at Aaron Mills, if anyone remembers. So you may have seen it there. So that is actually some of Angela's work as well. And he made so many of these, um, these types of, of things. So I'm just going to play you um, about what he would do when he had so many of these. So I made so many. I used to make three at a time, side by side. Because well, I spend my time to do uh, some of do the second one, but you know, decide it and do the third one. So uh, spending one day doing one, I can spend two days doing three. <laughs> so uh, and I still even today before. I... Yeah. So um, so these were just very uh popular um subject matter for relief because um you know people wanted uh you know indigenous figures to be featured prominently in the art of our city so uh he just had so many requests that he literally had to do three at a time which i think is hilarious um another one that angelo uh 
and really liked is of this man and a woman in a boat and the woman's hair is kind of flowing back and she has on this beautiful lace dress and I particularly really love the lace dress feature as well as the hair um I just think it's so beautiful and detailed and the lace literally looks like fabric like and when you're standing back it's kind of like oh my goodness that's brick like what you know so yeah he was really really talented um and um I particularly really like this quote that he said um that to me kind of gives a bit of an insight into why his art is so impactful even today I, I put my my spot in there, and that's in there, that's my own there. Yeah, so, you know, he says that he put his own spark in, in his pieces, in his own way. Um, and because as I mentioned, you know, he couldn't necessarily just do anything that he wanted. He had to stay in certain parameters for the architects because, um, you know, they were, it was supposed to elicit some sort of meaning or um, be like a coat of arms or something like this. So he couldn't necessarily just do anything. However, each of the pieces that you see, they're just so um, obviously Angelo. Like when you see it and you start seeing all his different work, it's just very typical Angelo. And I and that, and I know I'm not really explaining it very well, but that's really the only way I can explain it, um, except just to say that I think if that it's his spark, it's his it's his love, um, you know, that he put into every single piece. It's him, himself, that he put into these pieces. And so I think that that's why, even after so many years, it really resonates, I think. Um, now, he retired from Canada Brick at the age of 75. And after he retired, he unfortunately could not continue these large works only because he didn't have a kiln at his house and, you know, the other machinery. Um, so in some ways, it was really fortuitous that Angela was able to do these things at the brickyard because without the the brickyard, he wasn't able, he would not have been able to do these things. And without him, the brickyard wasn't able to do these things. So, like, we have to remember, you know, there was no artists in residence, um, position before Angelo, you know, he was that person. Um, and, and so that, that position only came about literally because people noticed how interesting and amazing his art was, and they just created that opportunity for him, right? So I think it's interesting because they both needed each other in that way, right? Um, now, obviously, he had a lot of different pieces at his own house, um, but, you know, he couldn't continue on with that. He enjoyed them, certainly, and he was able to do some small edits here and there, but for the most part, he, um, he was really not, he had to stop at that point. Um, he just didn't have the resources. Um, however, you know, I think it's really important and amazing for us to to note that he created over 500 pieces at the time of his retirement um, and they're featured across Canada the United States and even Italy internationally um, so you know he was an absolutely amazing artist that lived right here in Mississauga um, and he passed away in 2014 here in the city that you know that he loved and we loved him, um, of course, as well. So, um, you know, he had quite an amazing life, really. Um, now, I would um, definitely encourage everyone, if you enjoyed Angelo's story, um, we have this section on the Heritage Mississauga website called Heritage Diversity Stories. And as I mentioned earlier, all of this information is um was put together because we were able to actually sit down with Angelo and do an oral history. Now you may or may not know this, but we have done hundreds of oral histories. Um and with immigrants and different people 
And um, so we are now actually starting to put these into kind of story formats so that you guys can read them um, and doing things like what we did today. Um, but I would definitely go to the Heritage Diversity Stories because that's um, a big project that we're doing right now. So we have stories from, you know, Portuguese people, Croatians, Chinese, um, people from Sri Lanka, Poland, Ecuador, India. Um, we have Angela Blues, Blues' story up there as well. So, um, you know, I would definitely encourage you if you want to uh, hear some more kind of very feel-good stories of especially immigrants, you know, making really big impacts um, culturally, artistically, um, just in so many different ways into Mississauga and what it means to uh, to live here. You know, I would definitely check that out and definitely contact um, outreach at heritagemississauga.org if you also want to share your story. I would encourage you to do that for sure. The other um, big recommendation that I have is um, on an, for another Saturday matinee episode, our historian Matthew Wilkinson, he uh, talked a lot more about the brickyards in Mississauga. Uh, I only just very, very briefly touched on it, but it's a very interesting history. So if you're interested in hearing much more about that, I would encourage you guys to go check that out. That's on Heritage Mississauga's YouTube channel. Uh, and lastly, you know, comment down below who your favorite Mississauga artist is, and maybe we will talk about them next. Who knows? Um, so thank you so much for joining me today. And um, once again, I would encourage everyone to like, follow, and subscribe to stay up to date on all the heritage happenings here with Heritage Mississauga. Thank you so much for joining me, and I will see you on the next Saturday matinee. Thank you.